Last week I told you that God is the giver of wealth. And if you want to build wealth, the place to begin is by going back to your Father in heaven and asking him. You don't have to use shortcuts. You don't have to connive and steal and you know, embezzle and bribe and whatever else, whatever other shortcut people take. You don't have to. Go to your Father in heaven and ask him. He has tremendous, immense wealth. And he can give you. And he gave me because I had prayed that as I stepped into ministry, he would give me a home of my own. He gave me those two acres in Karen. I sold off one acre and built our home and developed the property because it had been cow pasture before. So it was undeveloped. And I developed our home in Karen. And we lived there for, I think, the better part of maybe about 20 years, maybe about 15 years. And two years ago, we sold it. And the reason was this. You know how in the video, they, or rather in the clip that we watched, they said that, you know, old age eats or feeds off young age, okay? And I was getting to the place where we were in our mid-50s with my wife, and we were talking about, you know, um, when you're growing up, you always count your years up. I'm 6, I'm 7, I'm 8, I'm 10, I'm 20, I'm 25, I'm 30, I'm 35. But when you hit 50, for anybody who is 50 here, you begin counting down. 20 more years, 19 more years. <laughs> you know, that I, like, like, like the lady said in the, in the video, the runway is getting shorter and shorter. So you don't watch where you've been, you watch where you're going. When you're young, you can watch how far you have left the st stationary position of the plane, but now you're beginning to watch the end of the runway. And so he said, you know, we've probably got another 25 years, um, and uh, we need to get serious or, you know, about uh, preparing for retirement. And I said, Lord, I've been a minister of the gospel for the last, you know, almost 30 years, and uh, we're very fortunate to have the home in Karen, but we don't have assets in terms of, you know, multiple houses that will bring a, a passive income. We don't have a business we're running on the side. Um, when I joined ministry as a young pastor, the elders told me that, you know, we want this to be your one and singular focus. Do not go into business. No side hustles. You're a pastor. You care for this church and this church will care for you. And so I've never owned a business. I've never done any side hustles. All I did was ministry. And now the runway is getting shorter and shorter. And I said, Lord, it's not going to end well unless you do something. Please, please, Lord, remember my prayer that we would retire well. And God seemed to say to me, I've already sorted that out. I said, what do you mean you've already sorted it out, Lord? I've, what do you mean? And he told me, I've given you a house in Karen. You have a whole acre. You live on a whole acre in Karen. You have a house in Karen. Sell this house. Go buy land outside of the city. And you have enough to see you for the rest of your life. And so I kid you not, guys, we sold our house for a hundred million. And we went and bought 11 acres out in uh, Lukenya, out in, um, you know, near Arthi River. And we're running a farm there, which is where the pig we're going to share next Sunday for lunch, that's one of my pigs, okay? It's anointed by the bishop. You eat like this, and you can feel the Holy Spirit. You know, there's just that kick because of the bishop's anointing. That's what we're going to eat. And I have pigs, and I have all sorts of things because we have 11 acres there. We own a condo at the coast because we said with my wife, she doesn't do well in the cold, and every June and July, we're out of here, we we'll become, in that sense, you know, cold birds or snowbirds, and we disappear for those two months and work remotely and then come back to the city when it's warm. And, you know, when you're freezing here, by the way, in Lukenya, us were sunbathing, and, uh, you know, and we come back to Lukenya where we stay. And in that sense, we do have material wealth. But if you follow my story, each step of the way, God has appeared and done a miracle. I say to God, God, you have told me to sell my home in Karen, and I will. Please give me a buyer who will buy it at this price, and I'm not taking less. And a couple of people did come along, and we said, no, this is our minimum. And somebody did come along and buy it. But I told the Lord, 
I'm going to buy a farm, okay? It doesn't have to be big acreage. I just want five acres or more. We eventually bought 11, but I'm going to buy land so that we can farm. But there is no farming without water for those of you here who farm. And so I said, Lord, give me somewhere with a seasonal stream that I can dam up and I can have water or give me somewhere next to the river. We actually are next to the Bagadi River. Right next, it's our border. And there's a, what, what is it called? It's not a dam, um, but it's been, it's been blocked downstream by the county government. So we are in the place where the water spills over and it's a dam and we have hippos in the river and it never dries out and we're farming using that water. God heard my prayer and he gave us exactly what we're looking for. Guys, you want to build wealth, you first go to your father in heaven and ask him. And then you can begin. And he will hear your prayer. But you remember what we said last time. He is generous and he gives. But he asks you to set aside 10% of what he gives you and give it back to his work. Now guys, even that 10%, he'll give it back to you in multiple ways. Even that percent, he will multiply in different ways. But if you're stealing from God with one hand, how can you hold out your other hand asking him to give you more? Give to him generously and wait for him to give back to you in his own generous manner. And he will build your wealth. And sometimes it will be in the form of money. Sometimes it will be in the form of health. You know the little foxes that spoil the vines as the book of Proverbs tells us? Those, uh, sorry, the Song of Solomon tells us. The little foxes that spoil the vine, you put 10,000 shillings in your, in your pocket and the police stop you and tell you that tire needs to be changed, that 6,000 gone. And then you get a cough, you go to the chemist, you buy dough for 1,000 and then you go home and your electricity is having issues, you bring a fundi and it disappears. And those little foxes eat away at the possibility of your creating wealth. Why? Because you're a thief and you're stealing from God and it doesn't pay to steal from the hand that feeds you. Now, this was last week. I want us to go on. Today's lesson, I'm drawing it from Luke chapter 14, verse 28 to 30. Let me read the passage to you. This is what it says. If there is anyone here planning to build a new house, doesn't he first sit down and figure the cost so he'll know if he can complete it? If he lays a foundation and then runs out of money, he's going to look pretty foolish. Everyone passing by will poke fun at him and say he started something he couldn't finish. There are three principles in this passage, okay? that I want to draw out. And today I want to give you four principles to take home. I'm really going to mess up with you today, okay? But three, let's begin with the three. Here's the first one. There's a man who wants to build a home. And the first step is he sits down and he says, hmm, I'm at an age where I can't continue to presume upon my parents, live in their house. I need a home of my own. He has a mental picture of what he wants to accomplish, a clear idea of where he wants to go, maybe even something that he's thought about a long time. In Jesus' little parable, this is the first principle, guys. It is this. If you don't have a goal, a clear goal, when it comes to building wealth, if you don't have a vision, then you're going nowhere. Wealth is fueled by a goal or a vision. You don't just sit and wait to become materially wealthy. And so the question I begin to ask you with is this. Do you have a specific goal of where you're going? when it comes to the creation of wealth? Can you name it? Can you break it down? Do you have a picture of where you want to go? 
Proverbs 29 and verse 18 says this, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no goal, where there is no vision, where there is no clear picture of where you're going, the people perish. And this isn't just about wealth itself. Let me cast this in a different light, even uh, you know, against the, the video that we watched. In your marriage, if there is no goal, if there is no vision, if you don't know where you're going, you will perish and your marriage will fall apart. Now many times when couples get married, what is their goal in life? Oh, we love one another. We just love the feelings. That's not a goal. Where are you going when it comes to your parenting? Have you sat down and thought? We used to sit down and with my wife would work out and say, we see this tendency in this child. They fight for their rights. They're always quarreling. This next year, in terms of character building, this is what we're going to focus on and teach this child how to be gracious and diplomatic and generous. Even in parenting, there is a goal. We have a goal in business. We have a goal in our career. But so many of us don't have a goal when it comes to marriage. We don't have a goal when it comes to, to you know, parenting. We don't have a goal when it comes to our social relationships. There we are filanga free. Whatever happens, happens, and we'll accept it. And so those things never end well. But our career is on track. And, you know, our business is on track. Because we have a goal we're working with. So what is your goal for the building of wealth? Set your financial goals and sit down and write them and name them and verbalize them. It's the people who set goals who create wealth. Here are my top five financial goals. Number one has always been to own our home. We recently sold our home and went and, you know, bought a farm. It was in the middle of nowhere. You know, no fences. It was like the savannah. We have hyenas that pass through. If you grow anything on the land, the hippos come after it. And so we had to fence. We planted, a, you know, a hedge. And we're trying to develop the place. But we haven't yet built a home. And so owning a home, our own home, is back on my list. And I'm asking God for it and praying for it. And I'm determined to work towards it as long as God gives me the means and the enablement to do that. It is a very clear goal that my wife and I have. My second goal, our second goal was to provide a quality education for our children. And our children now are out of the home. Two of them are married and uh, two are not yet married. And that one will put a tick to and say, thank you, Lord. But we also made a decision that we're going to educate other children. Last week, you're talking about the Logo Scholarship Fund. We have five children, five girls that we pay school fees for. Until they finish their university education, if God enables them to go down that road. And it's one of the things that we want to do. And we didn't take our children to, you know, the expensive schools, Banda and, you know, uh, Hillcrest and those sorts of posh, posh schools. We couldn't afford it. But we discovered that a good education isn't about how much money you pay. A good education is about, number one, the personal investment of the parents. And my wife, who used to be a teacher at Rusinga Primary and Secondary School, would tell me, I think the reason people pay these high fees that were being paid then, when our kids were going to much simpler schools, I think the reason they pay is because they are trying to compensate for their lack of parenting and their absence from the home. It's not about how much you pay. A parent's investment in their children's education is about the most valuable thing you could do to help your child in school. And so that we did. Number three was to live debt-free. That my net worth would always be much greater than my debt. If I have a mortgage, 
that I have enough assets that I could clear that mortgage if I chose to sell some of those assets and ensure that my net worth is bigger than my debt. To owe no man anything. To have what I call an emergency fund, I'll talk about that, and to have reserves so that I don't live from hand to mouth. My fourth was to be generous to the work of God. These are our four goals. I'm not asking for high heels. I'm not asking for clothes. I'm not asking for the many other things that could be done. Those I can own if my, if my net worth allows me to, but it's not one of the things on my prayer list with God. These are the four that I come back to God with and say, Lord, over and over again, enable me to fulfill these four. My fifth one was that would retire well, that would be able to have passive income, which is why we're starting to farm now, that would be able to have enough that when I pass away, that I would be able to leave my wife with sufficient resources to end her life well. And I say this, guys, if I didn't, let me say it again. Okay, guys, stop being so stingy with your wealth and keeping your wife away from it. She's going to outlive you, and it's going to be hers anyway. <laughs> Mr. Mugera isn't here today. That's why you're being so cocky. <laughs> okay, okay. So this is the first rule Jesus says to us in that little illustration. Where are you going? What is it you're asking for? Did you ever hear the prayer of a man who said, Lord, give me a bike, give me a bike. He actually meant one of these motorbikes. Give me a bike, Lord, give me a bike. He woke up one morning on his birthday and found a black mamba bicycle. You know the black mambas? It's the black ones that are sold, made in China. You know, you sit like this to balance it and you pedal like this. And he went back and said, Lord, this isn't what I was praying for. The Lord said, you asked for a bike. This is a bike. What are you complaining about? You should have said motorbike. <laughs> Can you name what you're praying for? Ask God for it. But then the second is this. Jesus says that if there is a man who wants to build a house, doesn't he first sit down and plan? When you have named your goals, sit down and come with a plan. I have said, Lord, my wife and I, we need our own personal home. And yes, I can't build now because, you know, I've just put up the fencing. Uh, we have no hedges. We have no electricity there, which is okay because we can do solar. We have no piped water. And so we need to figure that one out. And we're putting in a bowl and etc. etc. So the season for building the house is not yet. But Lord, within the next eight to ten years, let it be that when my trees have grown and we have a fence that will be here living on this property. And it may not be the dream house, but will be here, even if it's a guest way. That's our timeline and that's our goal. So you have a goal. What is your plan even as you pray. Now, God can do different things. He could surprise us tomorrow and something miraculous happens. The government is actually now laying down a road which we had not expected, okay? A tarmac road. And, uh, you know, they could come along and say, we're, we're bringing water to this place and we're bringing electricity. I don't know. The timeline they have, only God knows. And he could make it happen even tomorrow. We were not expecting a tarmac road for a long time to come. But the president has a project going on in the area called the Leather City. And he wants a road put down before his term ends. And so now the Chinese are on that road and working like mad. And we're very happy for it. Okay? So what is your plan? Sit down once you have identified your goals and begin putting timelines to them and thinking through what it is specifically you want to do and how long it will take. Because you need to have a plan. If a man wants to build a house, doesn't he, that's a goal, doesn't he sit down and plan? Here's rule number, th uh, number two. A goal without a plan is a pipe dream. 
is not going anywhere. And it is a people who take the time and trouble to think through, research, plan for, and set down a clear timeline, who see financial wealth. And you bring this up to God and say, Lord, I bring this up to you. This is our timeline. This is what we'd like to do. But, oh, Lord, we know you're the God of miracles. And you can do this in half the time, in a quarter of the time. And we just want to give it back to you. But because your Father in heaven says, you have not because you ask not. Ask him and let him bring it about. So set out a plan, time, and prayer, and strategy, and priorities. What the couple on the thing he told us, they had a goal and they had a plan so they could live with their mitumba car because they knew what their priorities were. I'm the proud owner of a Mitumba car that I bought 15 years ago and it is still on the road. And yes, people have told me a bishop cannot drive a car like this. And I tell them, me where I'm going, I'm not with you. I know what my priorities are and I still have that car. Yes, occasionally a wheel falls off, but it's still a car on the road. The people who have a car are the ones who build wealth. Here's rule number three that Jesus is saying. Once you have planned, make sure you have enough to get you where you're going. And yes, when you come and say, I want a bike, God can give you a black mamba bike. Because that's your goal. And if you say, Lord, unashamedly, I'm asking for a Hurley Davidson, I think they're called, he can give you that too. He is a giver of wealth. So know your goal, plan for it, and set a budget. And God can make it happen. A plan without a budget also goes nowhere, guys. You see, many of us are afraid of budgets, but let me tell you a couple of things about a budget. A budget is your friend when you're trying to build wealth. A budget is your friend because money is a servant. Every shilling in your pocket or in your bank account is your servant. And a budget is the manager who tells the servants what to do. Some servants, he says, run around and provide food for my master. Some servants, the manager tells them, run around and provide a place for him to stay. Some servants need to be given work to create more wealth through investments. But some servants, if they don't have a clear job description... You can carry them around in your pocket and what you're going to do is eat your servants. Because you pass by Java and you think to yourself, oh, cappuccino, 500 shillings, let me buy a cappuccino. You have just eaten 500 servants <laughs> who could have been creating wealth for you, but you ate them alive. Or you buy some, you know, high heel or something, you know, completely worthless. <laughs> We won't need high heels in heaven. You'll be whatever height you need to be. If you've always dreamt of being tall, you'll be tall in heaven in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. <laughs> Servants need clear job descriptions. And when you have servants that you don't have a job description for, and you put them in the bank... Do not fool yourself that they are working for you. They are working for the bank, not you. And they are creating wealth for the bank because you haven't given them a job. It's like a guy who's employed and has nothing to do. And so he sees his neighbor is, you know, planting flowers or something. And he says, Munataka Usaidizi, can I come and help you because I don't have anything to do? And he goes and helps them. What job description are you giving each of your servants? That, guys, is what a budget is. It tells your servants 
what they are to do. So let me put it different. Your budget is therefore a vehicle to wealth. And the third little key I'd give you is that the people who have a budget are the ones who create wealth because they know what their priorities are. They know what they want their servants to do. Go and get us a house. Watch a, you know, watch an agari. Leave all these other things, the lifestyle and etc. Don't try and keep up with the Joneses. My servants, I want you to go and get me a house. And that's what they're going to go and do because that's what the priority is. And that's the work you've given them. But if they don't have work, they're like a servant sitting in your pocket. By the end of the day, you would have eaten those servants who are in your pocket. If I showed you my wallet now, okay, and maybe Pastor Faith should see this so that kama kuna sadaka huku kanisa unipatie. Hakuna pesa. It has no money. Yeah? It doesn't have any coins. It doesn't have any notes because my servants are running around doing work for me. Now, if you can give me a few more servants, I wouldn't mind it. Eh? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but your servants are your money. Give them a job description. So let's go on to a budget and talk about what a budget is. This is why a budget is important. But let me explain a budget. And I'm going to give you rule number four today. That is very simple. It's going to mess you up. But if you keep it, you can even put aside all the other things I've told you and honor this one rule and you will create wealth. Now, of course... That is with prayer. Immerse it in prayer because God is a giver of wealth. But honor this one rule and it will create wealth for you. So rule number four is this. If you're living on more than 60% of what you take home, your income, you're living beyond your means. Think about that. I told you I'm going to mess you up. Let me explain it. Okay. Say... I decide to hire Steve, okay? And I want Steve to come and work for me on my farm and I will pay him 100,000 shillings a month. Now, I take 100,000 because then we can do the arithmetic quickly, okay? And uh, you, uh, some of you here are paid much more than that. Some of you are paid less. I chose 100,000 because it's an easy number to work with, okay? We can all do the maths. So I tell him, I'm giving you a gross salary of 100,000. The truth of the matter is, he doesn't get 100,000. Because the government comes and takes away almost 35% of his salary as income tax. And NSSF, and NHIF, and, you know, training levy, and all these other little things. The government comes, and like those little foxes, it nibbles at your salary. And when you look at your money, you say, ah, what happened to my money? I get 100,000. Hakuna, you get if you take aside 35%, you're taking home maybe about uh, 65,000, okay? The government takes its chunk. And so now, his, his salary, which was 100,000 gross, okay, becomes 65,000 net. But even that isn't what he takes home because everybody else comes and takes a piece, Okay? Number one to take a piece is your pension scheme. 5% goes to your pension scheme. Okay, so that's 5,000 gone. Boop, gone. It's disappeared. NSSF takes its part. NHIF takes its part. He's lucky if he takes home 60,000. Even though his salary is 100,000, he takes home 60,000. And here's my rule of thumb. If you're living on more than that 60, more than 60% of that 60,000, you're living beyond your means. Now, you take your salary, take out the, the, you know, the government tax and etc., and count, listen to this, I'll give you a term, your take-home salary. At the end of the month, what is it that lands in your bank account? That's a figure I'm interested in. What is it that you're given as a check, a salary check? Nobody does that anymore. What is it that you receive in cash if you're paid cash at the end of the month? Calculate what 60% of that in your hands. Forget the government tax. Forget NSSF. NSSF will pay your ticket to go home squared when you retire. Haguna Kituingine. It's just your ticket, so don't even bother counting it. Forget it, NHF and this training levy. I don't know who I'm training. Me, I'm done with my kids. I don't know why I'm paying training levy, but the government says you pay. 
and he comes with a big stick over your head if you don't pay, so you pay, okay? So forget that, because that you'll never see again. And count what you take home at the end of the month. That's what I call, it's not even your net salary, I call it your take home salary. 60% of that. And in Steve's case, where he earns 100,000, here's a shocker, he earns 100,000, pays 35% income tax, and then there are all these other things that he has to pay for. 60% of 60,000 is 36,000. And so even though he's paid 100,000 as his gross salary on his employment you know, contract, if he's living on more than 36,000 a month, he's living beyond his means. Now the problem is today, we all live at about 120% of our salary. And this is why we'll never see wealth. Because let me tell you a little secret here, guys. It's not how much you earn that, ma that matters. It's how much you keep that makes the difference. It's not how much you earn, but how much you keep. Because those servants that you keep, and they have a clear job descriptions, are the ones that are going to create wealth for you. The ones that are already assigned to pay your rent and those other things, those ones don't create wealth for you. It's the ones that you keep. But if you eat all your servants at the end of the month, you know how, again, on the video it was said, the salaries of one month never met the salary of the next month. That is the road to poverty. Because in that gap there, there are no servants creating wealth for you. They have all been eaten. And if you're living on more than 60% of what you take home, you're living beyond your means. And you will retire a poor man or a poor woman. Sure, you'd have driven a merc to your poverty. You would have lived in a big house as you headed for poverty. You would have enjoyed food in Java and in, you know, and in art cafe and wherever else as you were heading for poverty. Let me tell you a secret, guys. You only need to eat meat once or twice a week, okay? And even then, it's only four little cubes per meal. So you could decide that you do team up with your friends and you do go out for dinner, but they pay. Or you go for the company lunch and you eat all the meat you need for that week. You don't have to have meat on your diet. It's just making you fat. You can eat other people's meat, except when you're a farmer. I have pigs. I can eat my pigs, okay? <laughs> but don't go and buy meat. Just be invited to Pastor Faith's house at the right time. You'll eat meat. If you're living on more than 60% of your take-home salary, you're living beyond your means. I want to drum that in. And when you go home at the end of this service, go home and sit down and write down your goals over the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And then sit down with your present budget and ask yourself, how much at the end of the month have I spent of my take-home, and does it go beyond the 60% mark? Let me explain to you why I say 60% very, very quickly. Last week, we talked about setting aside 10% as a tithe to the Lord, because the worst financial wealth building rule that you can ever violate is to steal from the hand that will give you wealth. It doesn't make sense. And so be religious about giving your tithe back to God. Because he's the same one who will turn around and give it back to you and multiply it. As the Bible says, pressed over, pressed, and, pressed down and running over. Because you are faithful to obey him. Tithing is a matter of obedience. If you don't tithe, then you have a spiritual problem of obedience. So that's 10%. Now you've got 90% remaining. 
set aside another 10% according to the wisdom that was given us on this TV screen, that old age eats the young years. Set aside 10% now, especially if you're young, for the next 40 or 50 years. That will be your retirement when retirement comes. Think about it. You start working at the age of 25 years, okay, which is where most of us start, somewhere around there. And you work for the next 40 years to the age of 65, which is where most people want to retire because they're tired. Okay? So 25 to 65 is 40 years. And then the average age of Kenyans is 63 years. Okay? If you're over 63, you're on borrowed time here. Okay? Now, because you eat well and you didn't drink too many sodas when you were a kid, and etc., etc., you might live to 70, 75, 80, 85. Me, I've told God, don't take me past 80. I'd rather past 85. I don't want to be older than 85. There are too many aches in the bones and too many doctor's visits. I've got a house in heaven. Take me home at the age of 85 or take me before, but not past. I had a grandmother who used to complain. You know, she lived up to 99 years. God forgot me. All my friends have gone. I'm the only one here. Kwan, he doesn't love me anymore. She was ready to go home, and she just kept living. <laughs> so I've told God, 85, take me home, okay? But it means I worked for 40 years to the age of 65, and those 40 years I worked have to finance 20 years of retirement. It almost comes down to every two years I worked here will finance one year in retirement. Now, if you're living on to, month, uh, to mouth and you're eating all your servants and they never went and prepared for your retirement years, you will get to retirement and you have nothing. And, you know, the government tells you if you work for the government, this is your last check, Wende Nyumbani, and they'll give you a little kapen that is, you know, your retirement gift to Zekwaheri, and you go home and you have nothing, and you retire into poverty, and five years max, you're dead. That's a story of many Kenyans. Recently, the government said that only 6% of salaried Kenyans have any retirement funds. It's that bad. So hear me well. Set aside 10% for those retirement years. And for the next 45, 50 years, do not touch that money. Come and touch it when you finally retire and you burn through your cash and retirement package and you are now 75 years old and you will not need to worry about retirement. Eat it now and you lose all the interest, the compounding interest and all the wonderful things that happens to money that is invested to work for you and you don't touch it. Hear me well, guys. For those of you who are 25 years today and are just start starting a job, set aside 10% of what you earn and don't be worried about retirement. If you keep that as a life discipline, I kid you not, but you will retire wealthy. And if you are 35 years old here, then you need to be setting aside maybe 20%. If you're 45 years and you don't have a retirement fund and you're hearing me today and you want to get serious about it, then you need to set aside 30% of what you're earning. If you're 50 years old, then you need to be setting aside 50 because the runway in Aisha and you haven't taken off. But if you're 25, hear me well, set aside 10% and you will never need to worry about retirement. Now, of course, that 10% isn't sitting in a bank account. It's invested, so it's working for you, and it's creating babies, and those babies create more babies, and by the time you come in 40 years' time to check, you will have a tribe, you'll have a nation, you'll have a population of money. So that's 10%. Now you're down to 80. Set aside 10%, a third 
as your investment fund. You see, you never invest in shares unless you are willing to lose that money. Don't ever let anybody tell you that, you know, shares are the way to go and it's a guaranteed whatever income. No, you only invest in shares if you're willing and, you know, able to forfeit that money because things do go south. How many of you invested in Uchumi shares? Yes, I still have some Uchumi shares. They're not worth the paper they're written on. I lost that one. And that's the nature of shares. They go up, they go down, they go up, and sometimes they crash. And so you can't count them as your retirement fund because it doesn't always end well. But they can, in, they can grow. They can grow your income. And don't, uh, don't invest all your shares in Chumi or in Safaricom. The Bible tells you in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 2, invest in seven ventures. Yes, in eight in other words, diversify, because you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. And in the land of Uchumi, a disaster and a drought came, and it wiped it away. But if you have invested in eight other, you know, indices, then you can create wealth. So that's the third 10%, okay? This one you come and check after 20 years. I kid you not. You want to invest in shares or you want to invest in real estate or you want to invest, you know, in those sorts of investments. Yes, they can go south. But part of the problem people make is they invest today and then tomorrow they are going to check the shares market to see whether they're going up or down. When you invest in shares, forget about it for the next 20 years and come and look after 20 years. Less than 20 years, it won't have helped you. And day trading is a way of, you know, making your broker rich at your expense. It doesn't help you. Even real estate investment, you invest in an acre somewhere, come back after 20 years when the place is populated and the price would have gone up. But if you try and invest today and sell next year, you don't make money. You lose money on all the taxes and fees and whatever else. And so this one is a 20-year investment. Number four, okay, we've taken out 10% for a tithe, 10% for a retirement fund, 10% for an investment fund, and 10%, this is the best thing for your marriage ever. Hear me well, for those of you who are married and are fighting over the money, okay? The best 10% is called an emergency fund. What's an emergency fund? An emergency fund has two different things it does. Number one, when an emergency comes along, then you have somewhere to go and get money because there is an emergency fund. It gives you peace of mind at night when you're feeling pressed in by all your bills because you have a cushion. I told you last week that one of my daughters lost her job last year. And, uh, you know, this is uh, just a bit past COVID. And, and uh, we told her, come home and stay with us. You know, you don't have to pay rent. You don't have to, you know, um, be paying electricity and all those things. And she told us, no, Dad, I had saved. She had worked for about a year. I had saved enough that I'm good for 12 months. And if I don't get a job in that time, then I'll come and stay with you at home. And she got a job. She never needed to. But it immediately told me, this girl has heard what I've been trying to teach her and the rest of the family. She's been saving. And so she's not stressed because she knows she has enough to last her a year. And she got a job before her money had run out. And she's back to saving. She's very disciplined. She holds a good job with a good income, but she lives in a SQ, a bed sitter, and doesn't want to move. She even tells us, I tell her, you know, can I give you a microwave? She says, no, Dad, I don't have anywhere to put it. <laughs> can I give you a fridge? You want to replace our fridge at home? No, Dad, your fridge will take up half my space. She's that frugal, but she's creating wealth. Remember, it's not how much you're paid that matters. It's how much you keep, okay? So an emergency fund comes in when you lose your job. An emergency fund comes in when you're involved in an accident 
and you go to the hospital and they tell you we can't take you in unless you put down a deposit of 300,000. Well, you have it in the emergency fund and you can do that. Yes, insurance will come and pay later on and such, but that will be after the fact. So right now, this is what I need. That's what an emergency fund is. In Kenya's turbulent economy, you have to decide how much of a, an emergency fund you want. You can do one month. That's good. You can do three months. That's good. You can do six months. It's up to you to decide. I talk about 12 months because if I lose my job, I want to be able to take a break and then to have six months to look for a job and still have reserves left over before I pick up my next job. So I don't think one month can do it, especially if you have dependents and school fees and those sorts of things. If you have school fees, then you need to put an emergency fund equivalent of two terms and the food you need in that time and, you know, what it will cost you to continue paying rent and et cetera, et cetera, and say, over these six months, I need to have this amount. I've set it aside. I've put it in a bank account. I've invested it in a fixed deposit. And I do not touch it for anything but an emergency. What is an emergency? Pastor Faith's next, you know, high heels. When she comes and says, you know, give me a cologne, I buy. There's something and it's going to go. And it's found in this shop. And if I don't buy it, they're not going to restock. That's not an emergency. When you get sick, that's not an emergency. Of course you're going to get sick. If you didn't know you're going to get sick, today the bishop has told you you're going to get sick. Do you have a medical insurance? Or have you put aside funds? Sickness is not an emergency. Let me tell you what else is not an emergency. I'll give you a list of things that are not an emergency. Here you go. Rent is not an emergency. School fees are not an emergency. Fuel and transport are not an emergency. Your entertainment coffee restaurant is not an emergency. Your haircut is not an emergency. Your perfume is not an emergency. Your groceries, your electricity, your water, your land rates, your land rents, your cell phone, your estate fees, your household repairs, your car repairs, your credit card bills, your insurance, your gifts, your clothes, your vacation, your newspaper. These are not emergencies. Those are just the daily grind of living and budgeting your life. An emergency is so rare that you'll hardly ever use that money. But it's there, and you know it's there, and it gives you peace of mind. 10%. And when you have filled your emergency fund, if I say it's a year of my living costs, that is my emergency, then that 10% goes into what I call a replacement fund. Let me tell you guys, did you know that your car is one day going to breathe its last breath and die? And you have to replace it. So have you set aside the money for that or you go to Comba alone? Your refrigerator is going to die. It doesn't have eternal life. Your TV is going to die. Your fridge is going to die. Your, your freezer is going to die. Your cooker is going to die. All those things will have to be replaced at some point. And if you're young, let me tell you, the only car you should ever, ever, if at all, borrow money for is the first car you buy. And you take a little car loan, you know, the car costs you 600000 the, the The bank loan on that car or the, you know, car loan on that car comes to, say, you know, 50000 a month for three years or two years, depending on the terms you're given, okay? And you pay that, and when you're finally paid the last amount, do not stop there. Continue to put that amount in an account so that in time when your car dies down, you have been forward paying what would have been a car loan, but to yourself, and it's making investments for you and giving you children and you'll be able to go and buy the next car cash. Now, here's the other thing that goes with that, okay? The first car you'd ever buy with a loan is your first car, okay? The, car, the only car you'd ever buy with a loan is your first car. But here's the other side that goes with that. That car should last you 15 years, even if you're using tape for the ball joints. 
This thing of replacing a car over and over and over again so that you look good. That is a road to poverty you're driving down. Okay. Let's talk about now. 40% has gone. Can you see why I'm saying if you're living on more than 60% of what you take home, you're living beyond your means? Now, the 60% that remains is what your monthly living budget is. Out of it, you pay your rent, you pay your electricity, you pay your school fees, you pay your transport, you pay your haircut and perfume and your groceries and your electricity and your water and your land rent and your land rates and your cell phone and your estate fees and your household repairs and your car repairs and your credit card bills and your insurance, your gifts to others, your clothes, your vacation, your newspaper, your junk food, your, your gifts to extended family, your salaries, your medical calls, your wireless, your birthdays, and everything else is within that 60%. Your monthly expenses should not be more than 60% of what lands in your account. So what do you do? You move into a cheaper house. People keep asking me, you sold Karen to go and live in Ukambani? I tell them, yes. You're not me. And I'm not living your life. And so that's not my standard. Move your children to a cheaper school. They don't have to be in those posh schools. And if you've broken the 60%, we do this with kids because our first child, we take them to the poshest, little, expensive school we can afford. And then the second one comes. And now you have two fees to pay. And you're stuck because this one went to that school, so the next one has to go there. And you start huffing and puffing to try and keep up with, you know, school fees. God forbid you should have a third one, a mistake. That's why they're called mistakes. Because now you can't afford that. But you don't want the shame of pulling your kids out of, you know, a post school like St. Austin's or, you know, some of the other schools around here and taking them to Modangari Primary School where the kids come from Kibira, I mean from Kangware. Don't make that mistake. Say, God, me, I'm having four children, okay? And my 60% means 5,000 shilling school fees, 10,000 shilling school fees, and that's it. So even though this one could be in a posher school, when the others pile up, it needs to stay within that percentage. Say to yourself, my school fees will not take more than 7% of my take home. And that's how you decide where they go. The house you live in, decide. Cut back on your shopping. After all, you're overweight. You're eating too much. Cut back on your shopping. Eat one meal a day. It's possible. You can survive. I've tried. I <laughs> I tried. I've tried. It's not working for me. But anyway, <laughs> I'm a farmer. I have chickens and I have pigs. So, but, but you know, eat one meal a day. That's what it comes down to. Become a vegan, vegetarian, whatever. I'm a vegetarian as long as I'm not visiting somebody who's serving meat. <laughs> Make your own soup. Very easy to do. We do that. Downsize your lifestyle. Sell your car. Don't go to restaurants. Stop eating meat. Drink water only. Grow your own vegetables. It takes very little to have a kitchen garden. Start a side hustle, but stay within the 60%. That's how you create wealth. And so four little rules. And I want you to go home and process this and think through where you are. Number one, where are you going? What is your vision? Without a vision, a people perish. Number two, what sort of timelines and plans do you have to attain your vision? Number three is, you know, budget. And what does your budget look like now? Are you beyond your 60%? And then how can I tame it so that my servants can help me work for me to fulfill the vision I have. And last week we said the foundation of those four things 
is going back to your father in heaven because he does miracles and he can bring it about. Even if your budget doesn't work, God can still make it happen. I did not buy the two acres in Karen. God gave it to me. And he can do that for each of us. Now, God doesn't Xerox his blessings. And you can't say, even me, God, even me, I want. You did it for so and so, even me, I want. No, no, no. God has his blessings for you. They're not going to be the same as anybody else's, but he's able to bless you. This is the way you create material wealth. Let's pray together. Father, for some of us here, this message may come in a way that depresses us. Because we're feeling overwhelmed. We don't feel we're coping. We're huffing and puffing to try and make the ends hold together. We can't even talk about creating wealth because we don't have any servants to serve us. They're all gone by the middle of the month. But in these same words, Lord, I pray that we would find hope. Because all of us can pray. And we have a Father in heaven who not only has a means, but who longs to bless us. And who tells us you have not because you pray not. And so we can begin with prayer. And you are a miracle working God. And Father, we can begin with a tithe because it attracts blessings back for us. And you delight to bless those who are obedient and faithful to your word. And we too can be blessed. We can hope in these words, Lord, because there is wisdom in setting aside like the ant, little by little by little. And as we grow stronger and stronger, we can set aside more and more and more. And no one needs to walk out of here today feeling discouraged or feeling depressed. Because all of us have access to your throne and you delight to bless your people. So give us joy in spite of our circumstances. Give us hope even though we feel we're drowning in debt. Give us a sense of your purpose for us, the God in heaven who has promised to watch over us and who says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And all these things, whether it's houses or it is clothes or it is whatever, will follow. And we can follow with that. And so we pray. Give us a discipline this afternoon or tomorrow to sit down and to listen again to these words and to do what they call us to do. For therein is life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.